Coming up today on RPV City Talk, we'll be talking to the Rancho Palos Verdes Mayor, Brian Campbell, about the Portuguese Bend landslide, the PFAL trapping program, and if it's been successful, the city and your safety, and social media and how it's affecting the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, all on this edition of RPV City Talk. Welcome back to RPV City Talk. We are here with RPV Mayor Brian Campbell. Welcome to the show, Brian. Thanks, Mark. It's always a pleasure to be here. And um, we want to just get right into this. One of the objects of this show is to try to break down some of the long city council meetings that you have, break those down into a shorter format for people to, to make it a little more digestible for them. One of the things that you've been talking about in the city council meetings lately is uh, bringing back up the city council goals and priorities. Um, why is this being re revisited? Why is it being revisited now? Last time we did this was in 2014, and so it's always a good idea to periodically review what was important to us then with the idea of crossing off some of those goals that we've accomplished, reprioritizing other goals that for whatever reason have either risen up or dropped down in the, in the prioritization. And the timing of this is then going to span our local election here where because of term limits, we're going to have two open seats on the city council and it will include whoever those individuals are that are ultimately elected this November in Rancho Palos Verdes. They get sworn in the first uh, Tuesday in December. And it's important to get the new leadership in, involved in this so that they don't just look at the previous council's goals and priorities and that they feel like they've got some input uh, uh, as well. So also the city's wireless ordinance uh, is coming into effect soon. There's some new proposed cell phone towers perhaps. Uh, what is the status of this ordinance? We started working several years ago towards a wireless master plan. What we have now is probably one of the best wireless ordinances in the state of California. The reason this was such a high priority for myself and for the council is that with the new wireless technology that is unfolding out there in the marketplace very quickly, it's not just cell phones, it's all sorts of other uh, wavelengths of communication that require cell towers or what you would associate with cell towers to be installed. And so the process is, is that the first wave of these new antennas are now coming in front of the city and are now going in front of the planning commission to determine whether they're in compliance with our wireless ordinance and if not, what, because of their particular location or need for wireless coverage, what should be allowed uh, uh, to, to be able to be put up? And where is it right now? Then it's in front of the Planning Commission? It's going in front of the Planning Commission. If any of these towers are approved and, or, or disapproved and are appealed, then it will get up to the City Council and we'll be taking a look at this. But there's two, uh, there's, there's two towers right now that are coming up in front of the Planning Commission. There's dozens more, but it's important for the public to realize that there are hundreds and hundreds more of these installations that are coming to our community over the next couple of years. So how we handle this now will have an absolute impact on how all the rest of them are handled going forward. So we've always talked about quality, quality of life being so important here in, right. in Rancho Palos Verdes. What we want to be able to do is ensure that we have all the latest technology and, and wireless connectivity that the market can bring to us up here. But at the same time, we want to ensure that our views, that uh, the look of our community isn't negatively impacted by the implementation of these, uh, of these towers. And so if a resident ha has an issue with one, they should be watching the planning commission meetings or being in tune with what's coming up? Is that they should communicate accurate? with both the planning commission and, and the city council. It's easy to communicate your thoughts or your opinion for or against something with the planning commission. 
there's one email address that goes to all the planning commissioners and senior staffers at the city and it's PC stands for planning commission it's PC at rpvca.gov so if you've got any input on these or any other issue then send that to the planning commission you can always copy the city council as well the city council email address is cc as in city council cc at rpvca.gov all of the city council members get these emails we all read them mm -hmm. senior staff gets them as well you will get a response and that's a just a quick side question you get emails probably all the time are you uh it must be a difficult balance to, to find time to respond to all those, but you are a responsive council member, right? <laughs> You'd be surprised at the number of emails that we get. It's probably less than you might think. <laughs> uh, I, get, uh, uh, I get comments from the community all the time that they, that they sometimes feel reluctant to send in an email to the city council because they feel that we're barraged with it. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not barraged with it. Every council member I know reads these emails and, and uh, and if appropriate, uh, then they, they respond to it. Or sometimes staff goes ahead and takes the initiative. If it's something that they can answer quickly, they'll, they'll respond to it. So I encourage people to send these, send these emails in. And I, I do read them myself. I do respond when they need a response. Great. It's good to know. There you go. <laughs> send your emails. Send them on through. Go ahead. Hit that send button. Um, uh, also, the City Council has uh, created some subcommittee uh, subcommittees and have a subcommittee goal for the Portuguese Bend land flow. What's been going on with that? I know there's been some workshops. Um, what's, what's going on with the Portuguese Bend land flow? The land flow we're all familiar with has been going on for decades here. We have been patching the damage to PV Drive South as it happens. We spend anywhere from five or 600,000 a year to upwards of 900,000 a year. We've got a city council subcommittee comprised of Councilman Jerry DeHovic, Councilman Ken Dida that are now holding a series of public hearings. They've held four so far. And the goal there is to bring in some of the best minds that are available out there in that field. We just we just interviewed and hired a engineering firm that is going to help put together a plan on this w with the idea of being more proactive in slowing this flow down. All the experts have told us that we're never going to be able to completely stop it, but they will also tell us that there's ways to slow it down so it isn't so disruptive to traffic as we go out there and try to repair it. So it's a long-term process. Mm -hmm. We hope to ultimately get some federal dollars towards this as part of the new administration's very large infrastructure uh, plan that they have said that they intend to start working on sometime this fall. Great. And we call it a land flow, not a landslide, right? Because Correct. It's not the sort of landslide that's going to suddenly cut loose and, yeah. and go. It is, it is a slow-moving flow, and portions of it move as little as uh, an inch every month or two. Other portions move as much as a foot or two a, a month. So it's a very complex uh, geologic situation out there, and what might help slow it down in one portion of it may not work in another. So it's, right. it's a long-term planning process. We've got two dedicated city council people that want to put in their time and effort to, uh, to help have a positive impact on that. Until then, drive safe. <laughs> Take uh, your time that, on the... That's true. Be careful on uh, what we call the ski jump uh, over there because it changes every month. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Records retention has been uh, something you've discussed in the council meetings. What did the city decide to do here and how, how far back will the city be keeping records? What, what was the um, conversation about record retention? Some, some records statutorily have to be kept permanently. What many cities in California have done in the past is instead of keeping records electronically, they make hard copies of emails, for example, or other documents, and they throw away the electronic copy. So the permanent records are, are kept in file drawers or off-site, and it's very antiquated. It's, it's very contrary to transparency. And so the council 
went against what the recommendation was and we have decided to keep as many of these records as possible in electronic format and also searchable. That's the best way we can ensure transparency. Uh, one of my goals has always been to allow residents to know as much as possible what's going on in their own local government. Uh, one day I'm not going to be in local government as I get termed out ultimately. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to have as much access as I can to know where my taxpayer dollars are going. So uh, the, the argument was that the cost of electronic storage was high, but the fact is it's minuscule compared to the cost of storing hard copies of papers and, and off-site storage costs, things like this. So I was very pleased that, uh, that the council went in the direction that the rest of private industry is going and more forward-thinking uh, civic governments are going in keeping all these records, or as many of them as possible, in electronic format. But yeah, in your field, is that, is that what you see? Absolutely. In my own business, I'm in the commercial real estate business, but we actually have two different cloud systems that we, that we use as, as backup. It's inexpensive, it's efficient, it also allows us to work remotely. I mean, we have an office in Prague, for example. They're nine hours ahead of us. It works seamlessly when you're working in an electronic environment yeah. where we push the work that they need to be working on over to them in the afternoon, our time, and they finish it overnight. They, we get it back the next morning. We actually have several hours where we overlap and we can talk to, face to face and on Skype or, or just email right. if we need to. So that's, that's where local government should be going as well. And we should be learning as much as we can from the private sector, those lessons that work out there and implementing them here. Great. Um, the peafowl trapping program, the peacocks have can kind of a, they're fans and they're not fans. How has the trapping program uh, has it been a success? It has been a success in that we've, we've struck a balance between our residents that love the peacocks and just want them to be left alone mm -hmm. and our residents that would just as soon have the peacocks for Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> uh, right. But uh, uh, th that's been as a joke, obviously. But the compromise that we reached is that we now relocate several hundred peacocks a year and we have kept a peacock census. We actually track roughly how many of these animals exist in various neighborhoods around our city so we can get empirical evidence as to how effective these, this relocation uh, uh, process has, uh, has gone. It's expensive to trap them and humanely relocate them, but that works with the people that don't want the peacocks. It also works with the people who like the peacocks that now know that, that there's people out there, there's ranches out there, there's people in San Diego, there's people that, that want as many peacocks as we can send them. So <laughs> we've, we've struck a good balance. I just saw the most recent peacock census and the numbers of peacocks are absolutely down. So this does work. We're not eliminating peacocks from our community. I, I don't think anybody wants a complete elimination of them, but they're certainly down to a manageable level. How, how, what has been presented to the city council and what, what has the council thought about the Civic Center Master Plan program? Well, there was a survey that was sent out towards the end of, of last year, which had a list of different potential items asking what residents might be interested right. in seeing ultimately be up here at, uh, at the city hall location. So that's helpful in that not that many people responded, as is expected in a, in a mail-in survey, but it is helpful in getting an idea from those that did respond what is of some interest to them. But we've been exploring doing something here at the City Hall Complex for much longer since I've been on the council for the past eight years. This has been going yeah. on probably for about 20 years. But the City Hall project is a former Army installation. They used to have the Nike missiles here. It was actually operated by the, uh, the Army. All those missiles are, are gone. It's a very interesting uh, facility up here. We have underground bunkers that, yeah. that, uh, that I think we want to preserve from a historical standpoint. Uh, but the buildings themselves need to be remodeled and updated periodically in order for us 
to make the most effective use of them, both from the public's access to it and from our employees that work here. You've got changes in technology, you've got uh, heating, ventilate, you know, ventilation, new, new lighting that's, that's more effective. Uh, so we've, we've done a number of studies in the past that range anywhere from just remodeling and updating the existing buildings, that would be on the low side of the cost, to some people are in favor of starting from scratch and building a brand new civic center which would include items such as a sheriff's substation, uh, helicopter pad, fire station, uh, other other sort of uh, facilities like this. So I think we've got quite a ways to go in this. The devil's really in the details mm -hmm. because you would have to add all new underground infrastructure up here for, for power, water, gas, things like this. You've got to, you're going to have to look at what the impact would be on traffic, what the impact would be on sound. You start putting fire stations, police cars, helicopters up here. That is going to have an environmental uh, impact. It will have an impact on our on our quality of life. So there's a lot of details we need to really look into. There could very likely be a street light that would have to be installed on that corner of Hawthorne Boulevard at the entrance to the City Hall stayed right there. Mm -hmm. uh, there certainly would be debates within the community about that. The cost of this, uh, I mean, we don't have the money to just go out and, and build this new facility. There may be a reluctance in the community towards paying for it ourselves, whether people want to add that additional expense as, a, as an extra line item on the property taxes, for example, or fund a local bond. There, there's many, many issues besides uh, a wish list of what we would like to see down here at City Hall that need to be explored, discussed, debated, fleshed out, and, and financed before we're going to be in a position to say, hey, this is what the new city hall complex is going to, is going to look like. I would like to also point out changes in technology. That's already been something we've talked about a couple of times sure. in this interview. As technology changes, as we adopt to these new efficiencies that it brings to us, we don't necessarily have to have all of the same people working immediately next to each other or in, an, or in an adjacent building. There's more and more work that's being done remotely. Employees wouldn't necessarily always have to be sitting at a desk to be able to get their job done. They could be out in their vehicles. They could be out interacting with residents directly, working off of an iPad, for example, mm -hmm. instead of having to be confined uh, to a desk. All of those changes in how our employees are gonna work and interact with the public going forward will absolutely have an impact on what sort of building we ultimately need to have designed in order to maintain an efficient local government. So there's a lot to be done. I mean, I could go on for quite a bit about this. <laughs> I mean, that, that's my business outside of, outside of local government. Uh, we've got environmental issues that we would have to explore very thoroughly, for example, uh, to make sure that because this used to be a military base, that we mitigate any sort of uh, residual environmental issues yeah. that might exist, such as the ones that we discovered when we rebuilt the um, Point Vicente mm -hmm. Interpretive Center. Because as we found out, there was lead in the soil down there, and there's things that we still can't do to this day, such as dig deeper than a couple of feet, because then we're going to break into the barrier that keeps the clean dirt on top from the contaminated dirt uh, underneath. Most people don't know about that, but that delayed that project several yeah. years. And that was after it was approved in moving that they discovered that, right? Correct. And so we, so we've got to be very, very careful. We don't want to do what, for example, was done in downtown LA. You remember uh, probably 20 some years ago when they built a new high school in downtown LA on top of the old oil fields mm. without putting in a vapor barrier protecting the students from it and they couldn't even use it. I mean, that was a $100 million disaster. So the, the advantage of, of living and working in a smaller community like Rancho Palos Verdes is all the residents are much closer to the local government. They are much closer to their elected representatives. Yep. We, are all, we are all much better able to communicate with each other and head off any of these possible mistakes before they actually happen. So I'm a believer in regards to 
anything we do here at City Hall, that we take a measured approach and do all of our homework up front, thoroughly discuss it with the public so that we ultimately end up with a facility that works for all of us. Excellent. It's got a long ways to go. Have a long ways to go. <laughs> uh, the city has taken some measures, uh, and I really specifically the city council has taken some measures to make the city safer. What are some of the measures that you have taken to eliminate or mitigate uh, what in California is an increased crime rate? That's a, that's a great question, and I'm glad you asked it, because the city has taken a very aggressive approach towards trying to mitigate the crime wave that has swept California. I mean, I think most people that stay informed understand that some of the laws that we have voted into place have reduced the sentencing on, on some of these crimes. It puts a lot of criminals out on the street earlier than they otherwise would be. Some of these crimes are called catch and release crimes now where people can literally be burglarizing your car or your house. They could be caught red-handed, they're taken down, they're booked, and because it was less than $1,000, for example, they're just released back into the community. They could go back out and commit another crime that afternoon. I mean, we hopefully will see a rollback of some of this bad legislation at the, at the state level. So that's the macro standpoint. Yeah. What here? we've done here is that because we've got such a great financial situation in our city, we can react to this. The, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department is who we have always contracted with to provide our policing services. They have been enormously responsive and flexible to what we need as a community. We have, we have tailor made and structured our contract with them to fit exactly what we need here. We have dedicated patrols. We have uh, invested better part of a million dollars on the ALPR cameras. Those are the license plate reading cameras, which have proven to be very effective. We've got... And those are throughout the borders of the city, right? Throughout the borders of the city. We've, we've got the innovative, what we call the ring doorbell system now, which mm -hmm. the city's been able to negotiate a significant discount off of what the normal retail price is for this, with the, which the residents can avail themselves of. And so all of these different mm -hmm. technologies from uh, from ring ALPR to and, and more boots on the ground more right? boots I mean, more boots on the more ground cars. more dedicated boots on the ground I mean the, the sheriff's deputies that we have up here are ones that have worked up here for the most part for years and years and years they know the community we know we know them and while we've increased that sheriff's budget probably 30 percent over the last couple of years uh, it, it has absolutely had a positive impact on limiting crime uh, in our city. I mean, one of our goals is to have the safest city in the South Bay, and if we're not already there, I think we're fast approaching that, and, and we will continue to tweak and modify our approach with our partners at the LA County Sheriff's Department in order to maintain this safe environment that, uh, that, uh, that we expect. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Uh, people have discovered Palos Verdes. They've discovered it through social media. What actions has the city taken to um, mitigate some of the tourism, parking issues, keeping residents safe? Uh, and, and what have you done to make sure that your residents get to enjoy their weekends too? That's a real balancing act that we've got to accomplish. We always want to be able to put our residents first. They're the ones mm -hmm. that own the parks. They're the ones that that uh, uh, that, that use them the most. That uh, that notice first when when things are going wrong. Mm -hmm. And what we've been able to do, and I'll I'll use uh, Del Cerro Park as a good example. Del, Del Cerro Park, the amount of cars that park up there now is many, many times more than what, what it was just a few years ago. I mean, I hike that park all the time. It's walking distance from my house. Yeah, and, and you've, you're a hiker too, so you know these trails. You, we you we hike every, I mean, my, my family, my, my boys, my wife and I, I mean, we're out there in the open space all the time. We do hike. I was hiking last night, yeah, uh, as, as a matter of fact. <laughs> we, I mean, we love it. So it's one of the reasons we moved here, and, along with many other people that moved here for the, for the same reason. But we have been able to work on different 
parking designs and restriping curbs, eliminating parking from one side of the street, for example, eliminating parking from residential streets, uh, implementing permit parking for our residents to make sure that the crowds that come to enjoy our parks don't don't overflow into their into their neighborhood uh, and block their driveways and, and block the driveways which actually has happened in mm -hmm. in some cases so what what is beneficial in regards to addressing this overflow of cars that we have is that the solutions can be quickly implemented and don't cost that much you're talking about painting curbs you're talking about putting up permit only signs we've got uh, we've got a robust enforcement program up there that will that will write tickets yeah i know and the volunteers are out there the volunteer police officers are out there all absolutely the time. absolutely and they, they all know what they all know what the you know what what the rules are and and, mm -hmm. and they implement and the sheriff's department's been been great on that we still have a ways to go there's there's several individual residences that just because of the configuration of their driveway or where it is, we still need to help improve their situation a bit. And we're looking at a number of different alternatives, but we've made a big positive impact so far. We still have a ways to go, uh, but we're flexible, we're entrepreneurial, and, uh, and I'm convinced that we'll solve it. And, and you're well aware of it. The social media, social media in general has, has seen Palos Verdes. People are putting up Instagrams of their favorite hiking spots. And you guys are aware of this. You're on top of it. We, we, we are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, the social media has helped the rest of the world discover what we discovered many years ago yeah. when, when most of us moved uh, here like I did almost 20, right. almost 20 years ago. We don't ever want to close off our community to, to the outside public. I mean, they've got a right to be able to enjoy these parks also. We're just trying to manage it in a way where we're both accommodating to our visitors, uh, but also put our residents' interest and convenience first. Absolutely. So outside of the city council, as mayor, you ha you're required to, at times, do appearances. And basically, you live a pretty busy life already, and you're mayor. <laughs> how, how are you able to balance that? And um, uh, how is being mayor suiting your very busy schedule? Well, I like the job. I mean, at some point here, I'm going to be termed out. You yeah. will not hear me then or has anyone ever heard me complain about the job or complain about the hours or complain about uh, uh, the stresses it puts on the rest of my life? I like this job. If I wasn't involved with city council or in this case the mayor, I would just be involved in the community doing something else. I'd be coaching more. <laughs> I'd be I'd be more involved in in charitable groups. I mean, this is just my way of being involved in in the uh, in the community. So I feel like I've got pretty pretty good balance. I also uh, my secret is that I involve my kids. I've got two teenage boys. I involve my kids where it's reasonable in as much of this as I can. I think it's a great learning experience for them. Uh, it's, it gives them firsthand experience in showing how just one or two people, if they set their minds to something, can really make a big difference in, the, in their community. So for me, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I think for them, Maybe not always, but 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 <laughs> but uh, but sometimes it takes a little convincing to get them to understand why it would be worthwhile going to you know particularly uh, you know public event. Yeah. But we go to these things anyway. We go to the Fourth of July. We ones. go to Whale of a Day. We, yeah. I mean, I enjoy going to the to the homeowners association or public picnics, and uh, and it's and it's a lot of fun. Great. All right. Well, thank you for taking some time with us here at RPV TV to be on RPV City Talk. Thank you very much, Mayor Brian Campbell. You bet. I appreciate it. This has been this edition of RPV City Talk. For RPV TV, I'm Mark J. Dottie.